Welcome to the Silver Screen Guide Podcast, where we discuss films from every genre. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast. Welcome back, listeners, to the for now final installment in our Three Mothers retrospective series. Today we are reviewing Luca Guadagnino's 2018 reimagining of Suspiria. This is your co-host Corbin. I'm Alan, and yeah, we were supposed to review this back in November, I want to say. And then, <laughs> funny story, the only theater, because at that time I was in Chicago, and the only theater that was playing it was an hour away on a Wednesday night at 7 p.m., and there was no way I could get to it. And that was like the only showing for the foreseeable future uh, really anywhere around where I was at. So that kind of put a little bit of a worm in our schedule, and we had to figure out a different time to watch Suspiria, which ended up being when it was released on Blu-ray, which just happened like last week. Yeah, we did have to postpone it a little bit, but not very long, thankfully, and hopefully that gave more of you an opportunity to check it out if you wish. You may have been in Alan's situation where your theater wasn't carrying the film, but thankfully due to quick release windows for uh, home video, they, they don't stay in the theater too long before you can watch it in your own home right. cinema, which is exactly what we did. And I'll admit, based on the trailers, I was looking forward to seeing this movie. It looked incredibly captivating intriguing i was intrigued to see what luca guadagnino could do with the a new suspiria movie and i was too i remember now the new suspiria remake had been kind of in talks for a number of years i believe 2007 is really when really when it all began uh luca was able to convince dario argento and daria nicaldi that we could make a remake of their Suspiria. And the uh, first trailer dropped about a year ago or so. Uh, and remember we both watched and we're both just like, hmm, that looks pretty good. Uh, and so since then, I've been pretty excited, but also I've been kind of like, I really wonder how he's going to handle this because I knew that he had mentioned that it was not necessarily going to be a remake, but more of a reimagining. It's going to homage the original but also be in its own camp. And that makes sense because Suspiria is at the original Dario Argento's film is at such a high bar oh, yeah. that to try and recreate it would not be a smart idea. So what Luca did here was create his own film that is so separate from the original. It could be called something else, but it nevertheless is still kind of based off of the core idea yeah. of the three mothers, Susie Banyan in the Tans Dance Academy and the witch coven that presides there. Right. And so – and if you watch the movie, there are moments where you're like, okay, I, they lifted this right from the original. But for the most part, it's pretty much its own movie. You don't need to see the original to see this one or vice versa. They are completely – the two – the 1977 original and the 2018 remake or reimagining are two separate films. So you could watch one or the other and it won't affect your viewing for either one. And listeners, I should mention, if you haven't heard our reviews of the previous three films, then those will be attached in a link below. Go ahead and click those. Listen through all of our reviews of the Three Mothers trilogy. So then that'll help you inform your thoughts on how... Uh, we thought of this movie while reviewing it because I know I will make a couple references to the other movies and what I thought of those. So to enrich your experience listening to this one, go ahead and go into the archives and check out our other trilogy. Now, here's something kind of interesting. Uh, one of the biggest things that kind of regarded was regarded from the original was how was by its sense of style. And I know that we mentioned in the podcast back in that original uh to Spiria review that one of the our biggest issues was that it was very much style over substance. Um, now it seems, and this was something that I read before, uh, Luca was just like, nah, I kind of want to do something different, and at least especially when it comes to style. So b beforehand, he had 
with Dario Argento, he had a ton of color in his movie. But this one, he did a complete opposite and had it very washed out. Still shot on film, but uh, was the color instead of being like very having a lot of primary colors being very vibrant, he took it almost completely out. It's getting rather close to a uh, black and white movie than it would anything else. One interesting thing though too is that they did not use color correcting lenses uh, with the cameras. So it gave it an even more washed out feeling than what you would typically see really with most other movies here. Yeah, I noticed they were going for something completely different judging by the trailer. Everything is more so kind of an earth tone, yeah. kind of drab and blandish. It's still – some of the things still look good and still are eye-catching but not in the same way. And one of the problems that I, I did have, though, while watching the movie was I had trouble actually seeing what was on screen. I did watch this in the theater room. I didn't get to watch the Blu-ray, so I'm sure that probably would have made things sharper. I watched it in standard definition, and it probably didn't help my laptop screen, although it was turned down to the lowest brightness setting, was probably still washing out the image in front of me so sometimes during bigger scenes i had to kind of push my laptop screen down in order for me to actually tell what was going on on screen yeah and that's kind of where i wish the blu-ray would have been present because there are certain scenes where if so much is going on it's kind of hard to make out especially in standard def uh but yeah that's not necessarily a criticism that's more of a criticism of the way that the that the dvd was made as i get i suppose not necessarily the way that the film was made to a certain extent. But, yeah, I'm still with you. Even with me, it was just kind of hard to make certain scenes out because just the quality overall. And as Alan mentioned, this movie was being bounced around as early as 2007, which was, you know, 11 years ago now. And I, listeners, I told you I would go back and rewatch Suspiria twice this past week with both commentaries and i did and i highly recommend them the first commentary is from troy howard the second is from david delval and Derek botel they are all have a wealth of knowledge concerning dario argento and suspiria i did prefer troy howard's commentary a bit more and i did learn some interesting stuff such as david gordon green who we know recently created and did the sequel to Halloween, which we do have a review for. He was actually slated to direct in 2008 with Natalie Portman starring. Yes, and yeah, he was, I think it was also by Luca's request that he would be the director of the Suspiria reimagining, or remake, I think it was at the time. Uh, but he ended up dropping the project but later on, and Luca took up the helm. Uh, yeah, I, d I didn't know that at all, that those two were attached that would have been a very different movie yes would have been very very that was different the case now the other things that i learned was the kind of suspiria theme at least that's what from what i understood was actually based off of like the you know the musical rhyme it was based off of jesus loves me really yeah i didn't know that they took that and kind of uh, revamped it hmm and also there's a really cool flash of our uh, Dario Argento screaming at the bottom left of a frame when Susie gets in the taxi. When the thunder cra when the lightning flashes, you can see Argento's face like screaming. It is like one second really? inserted in there. Super cool. You have to look for it. There's a one or two other things you got to go back and look for. Interesting. Uh, I also learned that they wanted a live panther in the Black Queen's room in the end. Um and uh, one of my thoughts that I finally got was I would love to see this movie without dialogue and only the Goblin soundtrack. That would be a cool experience. That would be awesome. I know that uh, for Star Wars, Harmy did something similar when he redid the original trilogy and like they're as close as he could with their original theatrical releases. One of the audio tracks on there was just the score. No dialogue, no sound effects, just the score for Star Wars. And I watched a few minutes of it. It was pretty cool. But especially with a movie like Suspiria, that would be very interesting to see if someone decides that they decide – someone decides that they uh, can release that. That would be very interesting to see. Now, do you know how well this movie did at the box office? Because I'm intrigued to know how it was received. 
So this is kind of interesting, and this might be why it was hard for me to see it. It only released in 311 theaters uh, as its like highest number. Now really? with that, now with that being said, the domestic numbers were only about two and a half million foreign. 4.7 million for a total of about 7 million. Um, so that's not great. Um, I mean, for an indie film, it's pretty good, but still 311 theaters is not... Well, I've, it's interesting that a movie by Luca, who did Call Me By Your Name last year, which was got pretty big praise and got pretty popular, didn't do as well with the Suspiria remake, which I would assume would bring in a lot of cult followers who just love that original movie. And maybe it did, but it's still interesting that it only released in so many theaters. Now, the budget is suspected, according to Wikipedia, to be about $20 million. Um, I have no confirmation of if that's true or not, because it wasn't on Box Office Mojo. So, if that's the case, it only made back not even half of its budget in the in the total box office. That's really confusing to me, why they would put it in such limited release... And not, and they would lose money on making it because it is done by Amazon Studios, right? Which is doing more and more films. Uh, Amazon Studios didn't do Patterson, did they? They did. Oh, okay. So I was right. So Amazon Studios, but didn't Amazon Studios? Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't they also do Manchester by the Sea? Yes, that's also correct. Yeah, and that was an Academy Award winning film, right. and. So Amazon Studios seems to be kind of going more for the indie type, almost art house projects with some of these movies. They did a couple others this past year, such as You Were Never Really Here, which Alan and I both saw. Mm -hmm. And you can hear Alan's thoughts on the podcast. You can read my thoughts on Letterboxd for that movie. And also, uh, he won't, don't worry, he won't get far on foot. I don't even remember that one coming to. A theater near me. Yeah, so, I don't. I don't get it. That one, I knew. I watched it release, but I never got the chance to see it. It may have come to a theater around where I was at, but I haven't seen it. Regardless, so I mean, Amazon Studios is putting out quality films, regardless mm -hmm. what you ultimately think of them. But I just, I don't know. Not many people can see these movies. It seems like, and they're not right. making their money back. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what their ploy is here. It's also interesting too, because from what I've read, this is their very first horror movie, which yeah, that makes sense. Um, is still interesting because horror, I know, is a pretty big thing now, and yet they didn't really market it or release it really to much extent it was it played mostly at film festivals i know that one scene played at uh comic con in, in, in i want to say april um and from what it was all it's the olga scene and if you've seen the movie you probably know what scene i'm talking about but essentially it was so traumatizing that people were in, in the walking out and it was just that one scene and people were expressed that it was very traumatizing so my guess is due to the nature of the movie and how it ended up uh, especially at the very end, they may have pulled it back more than they would other movies like uh, Manchester by the Sea because it's already not going to make much money and not many people are going to see it. So why spend more money on getting it out there to for people to watch it and then not go see it and lose more money in terms of being, being put in theaters than it would to release it limited on a limited release and just kind of keep it in that kind of a reign. And I know you and I speculated somewhere, I don't remember where, maybe it was in private conversation, I don't remember, that this maybe might be an Oscar contender for cinematography, just as Call Me By Your Name was, right. because it's done by the same cinematographer, the shots from the trailer looked well, I know we were wondering, could we see Suspiria reach the Oscars? Well, we were dreadfully wrong. This movie is nowhere to be found at the Academy Awards. Yeah, which is also very interesting to me, not necessarily in cinematography, but in makeup and hairstyling. Mm, and I'll yeah. explain that in a second because it also comes with a spoiler. Um, so when we get into the actual review, I'll explain why I think that. But when I watched it, that's one of the things I found to be very interesting that it didn't even get, not even a nomination for that kind of a not even animation for both 
Oscars or Golden Globes or really much else. There's a, it did get a few wins. Don't get me wrong. It, it got a lot of awards for other uh, award ceremonies. I think I won some from BAFTA. But the big the big guns like Oscars or the Golden Globes or the Critics' Choice, nah, it, it didn't end up on those lists, which I find to be very interesting, especially when it comes to like makeup, hair sawing, even cinematography, and to a certain extent, music. Uh, wasn't accepted and wasn't even nominated nothing just kind of put by the wayside and that very well could be just because it didn't meet the requirements for some of those like it had been so many theaters for so long things like that i could see it getting nominated for best costume design Mm -hmm. and probably uh production design yes so I could have seen those, and I'm a little surprised that it didn't. I would probably more so give it to costume design, but not not production design either. But right. oh well. Right. Now here's something interesting. Um, there was a lawsuit against this movie. Apparently, in a couple of the trailers, they used art from an artist named, or I guess it was just images from an artist named Anna. Uh, Mendita, she sued Amazon Studios because apparently they used her works without really giving the correct uh, copyright. And so they issued a cease and desist. And it was like, I think it was settled within like two days of it being released. They didn't disclose what happened, what kind of said what they came to. But yeah, it was very interesting that they had a uh, a lawsuit on their hands not very long into not actually before the movie was released. Now, of course, you can't find those images anywhere. They're not on any trailers or nothing like that. Yeah, as, as since then, but there was a lawsuit against Amazon Studios for this. So images, I I don't know what you mean. Images? How? I don't know. That's just what the Wikipedia article said. I'm guessing either paintings or pictures uh, that she created before then they didn't use, they didn't, I guess, cite her correctly or give her credit in the way that they probably should have. So she issued uh, a lawsuit against them and they were, of course they were now have resolved it, but that's my guess is what happened. She had pictures of something that were in the trailers that she didn't give authorization to. Hmm. Well, I'm wondering also, I could be wrong if images as they were like maybe recreating some images, she was known for because I know in the trailer there was a dance there was a shot of them dancing and even yep. if you go to letterbox that's kind of like the header image where they're all together and their legs are kind of bowed like they're moving in this like kind of synchronistic fashion up and down and it looked really yep. incredible that wasn't in the movie right yeah so here it says uh the first image is an image of a woman's hands bound with a rope on a white table, allegedly derived from uh, one of her paintings. And oh. the other is a red silhouette of a body imprinted on a bed sheet, which was claimed to be derived from her Silhouetta series. Mm. So I guess one of them sounds like it was uh, kind of taking from that, like you were saying, where they were similar enough where she could – Issue a cease and desist, and the first one looks like they actually used that. Uh, that I know. I guess it was. I guess it was derived. So both instances. I guess you're right. They were more of just so similar to how her paintings were that she decided that that was enough evidence to pull a cease and desist. Hmm. Okay. Well, I yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't remember those shots being in the movie. Yeah, because so. they took them out. No. Okay. Well, I guess I'm not too upset about that. I know that Argento did take inspiration from, and I know this from listening to the commentary, he took inspiration from painters as well. Oh, yeah. He did. Older painters for the most part that were long dead. But I can see why Luca would want to do the same. So. Yeah. And I know that, um, at least with Argento, if he did take inspiration from those painters, he wasn't directly copying. From what I understand from the article on Wikipedia, it's more or less saying that they took her paintings and did almost a direct copy because they were yeah. similar enough where she was able to issue one of the a cease and desist. So they must have been pretty close to Sounds the original like source. Um, yeah. So at least with Argento, at least as far as I'm aware, there wasn't any lawsuit against him for anything so it was my it might have been just like a homage or maybe he did get the right the correct uh, citation who knows 
it's a 7.01 IMDb. I forgot to get these scores earlier, but no cinema score. I didn't expect there to be one. Rotten Tomatoes has it at a 65%, though, which is getting pretty close to rotten. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty mediocre to borderline rotten. So needless to say, and like we said, it didn't do well at the box office. I'm how guessing could it? 311 theaters, though. So. Well, exactly. So I'm yeah. confused because I know Luca said, if this movie does well at the box office, we're going to do maybe even a prequel. And the prequel will be about Mother Marcos in Scotland in the year 1200 AD. Interesting. That doesn't sound, that doesn't sound appealing to me, but yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Maybe, maybe it'll be great. Maybe it'll be the best one. I don't know. If it ever happens. If it ever Say happens, yeah. maybe we will be doing that in 30 years. Maybe. Just like we Again. had to wait 30 years for uh, Mother of Tears to complete the trilogy. I don't know. Right. We'll see. Well, listeners, Alan is about to give you the plot for Suspiria, but if you haven't seen the 2018 remake and you don't want the film spoiled for you, go ahead and click pause right now. Go out and grab it or stay home and grab it. And go ahead and watch it, come back and click play, and we will be ready to spoil Suspiria and get into all the juicy details. Alan, take it away. So this is going to be a bit long, just warning you. There's a lot of uh, a lot of little details for this plot that I guess need to be explained to make sense. Okay. Suspiria 2018 opens in 1977 Berlin. A young woman, a young paranoid girl named Patricia makes her way to see Dr. Josef uh, Kepperer. The doctor openly accepts her and listens to her troubling story, one it seems that me he may have heard before from her before. She explains that the dance academy that she was at is filled with witches, and that there are there are evil happenings inside of its walls. Another young girl named Susie Banyan, played by Dakota Johnson, is seen making her way to the same academy. Upon arrival, she is told that they tried to phone her to reschedule, but could not reach her. Luckily, she is taken in for an audition and is accepted on the spot. It doesn't take long before Susie catches the interest of Madame Blanc, a head a head leader in the academy. Within days of Susie's arrival, she is given the ro- the, re- the lead role of the protagonist in a new dance called Volk. But not after Olga takes that role before previously and begins to snap and is accusing the leaders of all being witches saying that Patricia was correct unfortunately for her she does not she does not leave instead she is trapped in a dance room that Susie auditioned in while Susie dances for the protagonist Olga is thrown around the room breaking her ribs forcing her arm and leg into an inhu- into inhuman positions the other leaders find Olga later in the room they stick hooks in her skin and drag her away when Patricia left Dr. Yosef, she took her. She left her journal in his office. Inside, it explains all of the inner workings of the dance studio, causing the doctor to get suspicious. He goes to the police, but they will, and they reluctantly send out two investigators to do some snooping. The men show up, but are put more, but are put into a trance as the other leaders strip them in the room and begin to laugh at them. When Dr. Yosef meets them later on, they say that they found nothing in the academy. A few days later, Dr. Yosef meets with Sarah, who is a friend of Patricia. He tries to convince Sarah that the Academy may not be all that it seems, but to no avail. Initially, after her first meeting with Dr. Yosef, she becomes skeptical, even going as far as to warn Susie about the evils about the evil inside the Dance Academy. On the night of Volk, Sarah goes missing. She wanders into deep corridors of the Academy and comes across Patricia, hardly recognizable compared to when we first saw her. Unable to save her, Sarah runs away, but gets her foot caught in, I guess manifest holes that they the witches had made and breaks her shin bone otherwise known as the tibia some of the leaders find her and fix her leg enough so she can continue the dance sarah suddenly enters the dance but falls in pain as they reach the end dr yosef then returns home back to where he and his wife anke lived previously she was missing due to the war but seemingly has returned who is also played by jessica harper the old susie banyan from the previous movie they embrace and take a walk leading Doctor, leading the doctor to the dance academy where he is grabbed and taken inside. Meanwhile, Susie and the other leaders of the academy go out for dinner, and upon entering the academy alone, Susie is led into the depths of the building and enters into an ongoing ritual. Dr. Yosef, inca- incapacitated on the floor, and Mother Marcos is present, overseeing the sacrifices progressing with Sarah, Olga, and Patricia as they are disemboweled. When Madame Blanc attempts to stop Susie from participating in the ritual, Mother Marcos incapacitates Blanc by slicing the back of her neck. Originally, Susie was to be a vessel for, brother, for Mother Marcos to enter, but it is revealed that Susie is actually Mother Matris Superiorum, one of the three mothers. She summons Death Incarnate, which we did see in Inferno, 
and kills Mother Marcos and her followers, those who voted for her to remain in power earlier. This is a scene that happened much earlier in the movie, uh, and we'll talk about it in a second. Susie slash Mother Superiorum then grants Olga, Sarah, and Patricia a peaceful death and takes command of the Dance Academy as the rest of the students continue to dance on the blood-filled matter house. In the end, Dr. Yosef is released but is later visited by Susie, or Mater Superiorum. She explains that his wife did in fact die in a concentration camp and that his memory, and his memory of Patricia and Sarah and everything pertaining to the Dance Academy is erased. Back at the Dance Academy, the leaders are cleaning up from the ritual they had in it before, and it's discovered that Madame Block is still alive. The final shot of Dr. Yosef's home with a camera so there was a final shot of Dr. Yosef's home with a camera slowly zooming in to the initials A and J in the corner of their old house as credits roll. Well, that was a good plot summary, because this movie is extremely long. At least it feels that way. I mean, I guess in perspective, it's yes. not abnormally long. It's Two and a half hours. For some reason, I thought this movie was more like 240, 245, running closer to three, but it's not. It's two and a half, but it feels to me close to three. But nevertheless, I was really surprised looking at the runtime for the original Suspiria and then seeing the new one. I'm like, okay, it's about an, what did you say, an hour longer? Yep, about an hour longer than the original. Yeah, so I thought, okay, if I I, th I took that as a good sign actually when we first found out the runtime for the new movie because go back and listen to my thoughts for the original Suspiria to better understand why I thought that was a good thing. I guess just in brief, I thought this would give them more of an opportunity to develop plot points that were just quickly glossed over in the last movie. Right. And for me, I ended up watching this movie twice, I guess technically twice. I uh, well, my second viewing, I ended up skipping a couple scenes that I didn't need to see. Uh, but on my first initial viewing, I didn't really feel it. I was like, okay, it feels like a pretty good length. But on a second viewing, I felt it. I felt the two and a half hours, even after I skipped about 20 minutes worth of material uh, overall, I guess. I could feel it. And now... To be fair, I did watch this in the ex I did watch it twice in one week, so I'm sure that that also counts against me uh, in terms of me feeling the run uh, in terms of me feeling the runtime. But that is also interesting to point out is yes, they do take the time to develop a lot more plot points, most notably the uh, political stance in Berlin in 1977. However, when terms of rewatching it, it begins to show how long it really is on a second viewing and maybe in a few and maybe even a first viewing like you were saying yeah well i guess i can go ahead and mention some of the issues that i had with how they chose to develop through the runtime so like alan just mentioned we do have a lot of focus on current events pertaining to the cold war especially pertaining to germany it's on the radio constantly throughout the movie, and they even take the time to show a television screen, which really seemed weird to me because this almost felt like I was watching Bridge of Spies at times instead of Suspiria, and the amount of time they choose to kind of focus on that got to be a little annoying after a while because I understand this is Berlin during the Cold War. I mean, I can see the Berlin Wall in a lot of shots. I get it's super drab. It's boring, you know, Berlin. It's not that fun. I get it's during the Cold War. I get it. So the amount, how much time they're going to push that on me and try and steep me in the Cold War cultural zeitgeist, like they're trying to transport me back there, I think they do that too much to their detriment. Instead, I would have preferred us to take a deeper look at Susie's upbringing, something that we do look at throughout the movie, but something I felt like we could have solidified a bit more as opposed to some bizarre dream sequences and one shot of her mom saying, she's my sin I brought into the world. Okay, let's explore that a little bit more. I don't know how you think about that, Alan. Right. So one of the interpretations of what you were saying in terms of the of in terms of showing Berlin a lot in this movie. Uh so one of the bigger themes in this reimagining, I guess, of Suspiria is this abuse of power. Uh we see this 
And the biggest example that sticks out in my mind is when the two investigators come and they essentially put them in a trance uh, and are laughing at them in this secret room. So then it's only like a select few of the leaders there, but it's things like that. There's an abuse of power. So that also transfers to the world around Susie, which is also the, during the Cold War in Berlin, when the Berlin Wall was at its full effect, is Berlin at this time was also abusing its power for its own people. And one of the bigger things, especially there towards the end, most notably with Dr. Yosef, is um, how, how these big leaders should feel shame and guilt because they're abusing their power. But with Yosef, uh, that's one of the reasons why it ends the way it does is he shouldn't need to feel it because he was affected by it, but not actively participating in it. So what this is really showing from what I'm seeing here and from this interpretation that I've read is that it's more just showing the political stance, not necessarily inside of the academy, but also outside where there is an abuse of power. Although I will agree with you, I think that they show it maybe a bit too much. I think that, of course, now this also comes with the uh, more terrorist events that were happening, which they do bring them, which are pretty, from my understanding, pretty historically accurate um, in terms of what was going on. But yes, the reason why it is here is more to do with the fact of this theme of abusive power, not like I said, not out, not just inside the Ukrainian academy, but also outside in the in the world around them. Just by setting it in Berlin, I get that. So yes. my problem is it becomes heavy handed by continually pushing that upon the viewer and kind of I feel detracting from the focus of the film i wouldn't say that it necessarily detracts from the focus but i will agree with you that it does feel like they go back to this a bit too much now it really only isn't about the first half that they really uh focus on that aspect later parts of the movie don't do it nearly as often but yeah i, I do agree with you on that part they do kind of rely on it a bit too much I think that they uh, – more or less, I think that they're trying to put in as much historical accuracy as they can, when in reality, I don't think they need to do it as, to that extent. I was surprised to see when this movie opened, it has this title card, which I wasn't even sure was a title card at first. Yeah. It says, six acts in an epilogue set in divided Berlin, which kind of confused me because it's in divided Berlin – but I think it's important to distinct whether it's in West Berlin or East Berlin, because if it's in, if it's in East Berlin, it would make more sense why it's so, you know, fascistic and yeah. awful. But if it's in West Berlin, then that's different. It, it wouldn't be so dark and drab all right. the time. But I don't see anybody willingly traveling to East Berlin. That doesn't make really any sense so i i don't know this whole setup is a little confusing yeah i do know that that, that dr yosef does cross over to visit his home in one of the halves that's really the only time we ever see it though it was somebody moving to the other side of the city across mm, the wall okay that's with, just with dr yosef is when we see that and don't we get like some really loud music here uh, the opening wait. title yeah well, yeah I don't know. I was going to say it's not as effective in the least as compared to Goblin score. And I got to say, I'm a little tired of that's how we're going to make things really heavy and dark is by something really loud, almost overbearing. And it's usually always strings, it seems like. Yeah. And one interesting thing here, too, is that they also use uh – written songs i think there are three moments where they use a uh, written song uh as like part of the movie and don't get me wrong i think that they're fine songs i really like the tune of them but uh they i guess once would be fine but they seem to heavily rely on this written song like more than once especially they're towards the end i think that it, although it was effective in what it was trying to do i think that maybe just score would have works just as well if not better yeah you mean when they pull out songs with actual lyrics yes yeah okay that shocked me because that really threw me off i was not expecting i was not expecting this movie to employ yeah lyrical songs mm -hmm. so when it did happen i it threw me off big time right now it it is interesting too because the person 
the composer for this movie is actually the lead singer of a band Radiohead, uh, <laughs> which is kind of interesting because oh. last time in the original movie, they had a band called Goblin come and make the score. Now, he it wasn't just Radiohead the band. It was just the lead singer that did all mm-hmm. the composing, which I believe this is his first movie he's ever composed for. But here's an interesting fact. He did take a lot of inspiration from Blade Runner, which you can kind of tell in a few scenes where that inspiration is coming from. Hmm. I would have to rewatch it with that mindset to really see it. I I can't remember it enough. Honestly, I don't remember a thing about the score except the that final song pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. The song is the biggest part. Uh there are a couple of scenes where I really noticed it and I tended I, I kinda liked it. Um I try to remember I think it would have it wasn't long after Olga's scene. Uh, is when it really does play in effect, and there's a couple more moments. I can't even off the top of my head, but it's it, they use they tend to use a synthesizer. It sounds like for some of the sounds, and with the foreknowledge that it was based off of or inspired by Vangelis, I can see it in a few scenes. Hmm. Well, act one opens with. Dr. Yosef, who is a, like a therapist, psychiatrist type person, and he is having a therapy session with none other than Chloe Grace Moretz, which surprised me she was in this movie. And I couldn't help but notice this old man looks fake. <laughs> to me, he didn't look like a real old man. It looked like he was wearing some kind of prosthetic makeup. Come to find out that's the case. That old man is Tilda Swinton in yes. makeup. She does a she has a triple role in this movie as Dr. Yosef, uh herself as Madame Blanc, and Mother Marcos. Which is What? Yes. That is her. So when it came to the very ending scene, it was, as they stated, very hard, very difficult special effects wise, because she had to be in three places at one time. Yeah, I was thinking, I knew she was the old man in the uh, Madame Blanc, yep. which would be difficult because they're, they're, although they're in very few shots together, which is probably why, uh, but I had no idea she was Marcos because yes. of all that gross makeup. Right. And here's something mm. actually kind of funny is they tried to pass him off as an actual person. They created a fake IMDb page for him. Uh <sighs> Tilda Swinton actually wrote writ, wrote out his biography for that page. Uh, his name, uh, his fake name is Lutz Ebersdorf. And <laughs> um, that's his name. It was his fake name. And so they oh. went as far as to, like, people were kind of getting, what happened was there was a picture taken on set that claimed uh, that she was actually Dr. Yosef, Tilda Swinton. And... They mm. tried to cover it up, both the director and Tilda Swinton tried to cover it up by saying that no, it's an actual guy and all kinds of stuff. But they, the news wasn't really having it. It was kind of suspicious because the MDB page was totally incomplete. He wasn't anywhere else online that they could find. Um, so eventually they broke down and Tilda Swinton said, yeah, it was, we, it is fake. It is me and just heavy, heavy prosthetics. And when they asked her why, she said, oh, just, for the sake of fun, the intention was never to fool anybody. The genius makeup artist Mark Moyler, with notwithstanding, is always as always our design that there would be something unresolved about the identity and performance of Dr. Kepler. So, <laughs> what they were trying to go for was to keep the actual actor or actress who played this man, uh, kind of in secret mm. for a long time. Now that didn't last very long, but. That was their whole goal, was just kind of have fun. But even from a kind of a thematic standpoint, it makes a little bit of sense, too. Yeah, I mean, in some shots, I think, wow, that's some really amazing makeup work to transform yeah. Tilda Swinton into an elderly man. Right. But then at other times, you can tell they can't always get the mouth just right. And the kind of the mouth and eyes are some of the hardest places to yep. age. And that's where you can tell. So in some shots, I'm like, gosh, something just looks really off here. Right. So and maybe that lends to the overall feeling of the movie is even somebody you think you can trust. There's something not quite right about them. But you can read into it that way if you want. I, I just found it to be a little distracting and just 
it just pulled me away from the movie and made me question what is going on with this old man. <laughs> right. And see, I never had that. I always just assumed it was just some oh. random old guy of some actor that they actually found. And they, the fake IMDb page they made claimed that he was an old psychologist who just, this was his film de- debut. So mm. I didn't think much anything of it until I went to look up who was playing his character and couldn't find his name anywhere. Aside from being assigned to Toto Swinton, I said, that is not right. So there, There's no way. And then I did more research and found all this, that it was all kind of just a joke. Uh, mm. And I was like, huh. Which makes me wonder why they didn't get a nominated for Best Hair Makeup or Hairstyling. Because from what I was seeing, and maybe it would have changed on upon like a Blu-ray release that I got to see it on. But I had no idea. I just assumed yeah. it was an, like, an actual actor the whole time. Right. And to like, I did watch this on a pretty big screen. So I'm wondering if that was also why is seeing everything more up close in a bigger, bigger detail, blowing up those pixels. Yeah. Maybe that's why it, it, I was on to it a little more. Right. That very well could be. It, well, we do get our first mention of, she calls her mother, Marcos, which is different from the original Suspiria because they never called her Mother Marcos. They always just called her Helena Marcos or the Black Queen. Mm. I'm pretty sure we don't get any reference to the Black Queen in this movie. Not that I found. No. So, of course, we know Mother Suspiria or Mother Suspiriorum, Mm -hmm. whichever you prefer. But it's interesting she mentions Mother Marcos and... Uh, they said they took her urine, hair, and eyes. Now she can see me. So are we to assume in the end that she – I mean, uh, for some reason she has glass – like these goggle-type things on M- Marcos does. Mm-hmm. But do we assume she can see because she has Claire, Chloe Grace Mart's eyes? Not necessarily. Uh, so what they're looking for – this is why Patricia ran away – is looking for somebody to replace Mother Marcos. Right. Essentially, they're going to become a vessel, right? Yeah. So that's what they were doing to her. She ended up figuring that Patricia ended up figuring all this out and ran off. But she's found a bit later on, and she is there, getting towards the end when they then they dance folk. So my guess is she realized what was happening. Tried to I, I don't know if she told Sarah. No, I think she mentioned to Sarah a couple of things, uh, but never was able to convince her. So she ran to Doctor Yosef. And so this kind of a thing that happened with Patricia happens again with when Susie comes into the picture. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was I was wondering about that. And especially because in the when Sarah finds their kind of antechamber to the lair, she finds like body parts and mm-hmm. there's a picture. What the picture looked to me to be Marcos and Blanc, maybe. Yes. And it was framed in hair. I don't know why. It was just kind of gross. So I guess that kind of was a callback as they kind of take these body parts and do what they will. If the if it doesn't work out, then they just keep them, uh, keep them in their room or something. Yeah. So I, I don't know. It's kind of an odd uh, scene. Um, OK, the thing that I was also kind of confused on is Marcos is old, but Blanc is not. And they they have a picture of themselves from. From a long time ago, I'm assuming, but maybe one is just older. Yeah, I I'm not so sure. It, it They do make it out that Mother Marcos uh, is much, much older, and she's been running this to Kemi for a long time. We do know that it was, I think it, I want to say began operation in 1949, um, but they essentially did it out of the war. That's when they really began picking up. Uh, and getting a bit more popular is after World War II and ended back in around 49-ish. So the reason, and th- that's kind of the reason why, I, it, it, they don't really explain why Mother Marcos looks this way. I'm wondering if it's kind of like the original where uh, there was a fire that was started in the inside of the company and Mother Marcos got caught in it, but she ended up surviving and so did the rest of the dance academy. But they don't really make much of a mention of that anywhere in this movie. Uh, something else that I did want to mention was Dario Argento's original Suspiria came out in 1976, which is kind of around when this movie is set. 
They both take place in Germany, but this one is really heavily steeped in post-World War II, height of the Cold War, whereas Argentos came out during the Cold War, and yes. that trace was nowhere to be found in his movie, in fact. So I thought it was interesting, because I'm, I'm like, oh, it's in a completely different location, and yeah, it does take place in a different city, but... It's still they both still take place in Germany during the same year, pretty much. Yeah, a completely they, different results. Yeah, this one is set in the year that Suspiria was released. The original Suspiria was released, nineteen seventy seven. Uh, but that's one of the very few homages references to the original that are really in this movie, aside from just kind of the main story, uh, which is also interesting too because the original was more set on ballet. This one. Not so much. It's more of expressionistic dancing than it is ballet, which is much different, especially in Germany back in around this time. And I'm also surprised we cut to an what I presumed was an Amish family, but then Susie explains the difference. They're Mennonites, and there's a dying woman, and all of this is shown during the opening credits. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised they went with opening credits. I didn't really like it because I know the original Suspiria really immersed me. I'm already being immersed. These are kind of late credits to start popping up. I do wish they would have saved them for the end. I mean, that's just kind of a nitpick, though. We also have some very odd music over the scene that I'm not really liking. And probably the biggest takeaway is this lady's, you know, belabored breathing is reminiscent of... Helena Marcos or the Black Queens uh, from the original Suspiria. Right. And the I'll say this, the music doesn't really bother me all that much. I do enjoy the tone or the the tune that is being played. This sounds a lot like Sofian Stevens, which we know played a song for actually two songs for Call Me By Your Name. One was nominated. And I believe I mentioned in that in the Oscar, I think it was Reaction podcast that I really did enjoy. I do enjoy just in general Sophia and Stevens. So I kind of figured it was them. Upon doing research, it was not them. It was some other. It was some other band. But it does really sound like them. Uh, that aside, I don't necessarily find it. At least in this scene, the music fits uh, and does kind of explain a few things in terms of like the overall tone of the story. Um, but. I think that they utilize this is the first time they, they use the song and they'll use it two more times or at least a song very similar to it. So in this opening, it doesn't really bother me all that much because you do kind of get the setup of uh, you do get the setup of Susie's mother and how she's kind of incapacitated in her bed. She's bedridden. She's essentially dying. They bring in a pastor to bless her. Um, and you kind of begin to get the sense of that her mother may not be the gre the best mother that there was or something happened between them, but you, we don't find that out until much later uh, into the movie. But yeah, this opening scene, although I think it's, it's a good spot to open up with the credits because it does begin to introduce this theme of motherhood. Uh, so it doesn't bother me too much, but the music later on will get to be a bit used a bit too often, I think. I didn't really know it was a mom. At first, I thought it was a young girl. Then I thought it might be an old lady. Right. But we kind of settle on a not quite middle-aged woman. I really didn't understand this scene at all. Only in hindsight did it connect with the rest of the plot because we draw back to it a number of times about how her mom was sick and that kind of plays in towards the end. Right. Uh, but the opening scene just of here just more so serves to confuse me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The only reason why I bring that drew that conclusion that it was a mom is because later it's explicitly stated that she is a mother to somebody, uh, which ends up being Susie. So then looking back on that one scene, I put the pieces together and figured out that this was her mom in this opening scene. Well, okay. What was with when Susie got off the, well, she came down into the subway in Germany there's a big sign to it would be her right, our left, that says Suspiria. Yeah, I think it's just an Easter egg. There's not really much to it. It, is, I, it could also be a reference to her being Mother Suspiriorum there at the very end when she reveals that she really is. So my guess is it's not necessarily there for really anything important, but more of just foreshadowing or just because of an Easter egg. I'll give more detailed thoughts towards the end there when she reveals she is Mother Suspiria. But I will say for right now, I don't believe she is 
Mother's yeah, you're, spirit. there is really no indication that she is anything but a norm, a normal girl who ran off to join this dance academy until very late into the movie. And I mean, even further than that, I don't think I think she's just Susie Banyan. I don't think she is become Mother Suspiria yet. Right. Yes, you're very correct. She's it's this has also got a small theme of self discovery, I guess you could say. Uh there is a certain element of this thing called the shadow self, uh realizing the shadow self, which is very Jungian when it comes to a psychology uh view of it. Essentially realizing that uh the bad parts about yourself in term if you want to put it in terms of, say, uh Freud, it would be the id, uh is what you're looking at here. Uh, I do want to mention some of the editing and camera work here in the beginning. It's a bit reminiscent of Argento, such as kind of the quick cuts and rapid zooms. I do like some of those in the beginning, like especially when Susie is uh, performing her dance and we kind of cut to Madame Blanc. Or <sighs> There's just certain shots that work well in this movie, but I feel they're inconsistent. They kind of stop using them after a while. You are very correct. They do – the cinematography does change a bit as the movie progresses. And I think that some of its best moments are here at the very beginning because the way that they shoot Tilda Swinton is very interesting but at the same time rather terrifying. Especially in hindsight when you're watching it a second time, you see – because you know what's gonna, how the movie's going to end. And you see how they frame Tilda Swinton there at the very beginning. And that's where I really enjoy the cinematography for the most part was because the way that they frame her is really spooky. At times, it's almost as if she's the camera, just the way that she's positioned. There are, there's a moment when she's like sitting in – where she's sitting – I think she – yeah, she's sitting in front of Susie who's behind a mirror. And you can kind of see Tilda Swinton behind her because she's always wearing black. And then there's – then I think maybe even be in the same scene. She's kind of off into the corner uh, of the mirror and she's looking at the girls in a diagonal uh, – at, di at a diagonal. And it's almost like – again, it's almost as if she's the camera in that position. The way they shoot her is very, very spooky. And I – Especially in this opening, I really, really like it because of some of the ways that they were able to get certain angles and give her this presence that she's always watching. Oh, yeah. She is shot fantastically. Yeah. And more than that, Tilda Swinton does a great job of – it's really interesting because she – I was expecting her to come across as extremely harsh and strict to the point of being scary, mm -hmm. but they completely – play with my expectations there and go the exact opposite direction where she is super sweet and kind and caring for Susie. And she is still kind of like a kind of firm when she needs to be. And I think Tilda Swinton played her perfectly. And I, I'll go so far as to say, I think probably Tilda Swinton is one of the best parts of this movie. Yeah. I will agree with you that I think she does a very fantastic job and maybe one of the best parts uh, she at first I was wondering if she was going to be like a Terrence Fletcher from Whiplash, where she can't, Harry oh, comes yeah. off as rather sweet at first, but then once you de dig deeper and get to know him more, he's very hard and very harsh, which is kind of the case with her, but it's more I guess subtle than Whiplash was, where her intentions with Susie are much different than what you would normally than what i guess what you, you would expect because you'd expect her to be very harsh just like the original madame blanc was in the original suspiria and like i said to a certain extent she is but not in the same way she's very much a very subtle horror presence than what madame blanc used to be in the original yeah i thought that was interesting they kind of switched roles a little bit here because we do meet miss tanner who is played by alita valley in the original who is an extreme presence because of how kind of imposing and strict and just scary she is. This Miss Tanner is not like that at all. Whereas Madame, Madame Blanc, uh, who was originally played by Joan Bennett, she was kind of more so this sweet person until the very end. And those, those roles are switched a little bit there. Um, I, I don't really have a problem with it. But Miss Tanner kind of lived up to such a imposing presence from the original that this new one, it doesn't make as, as much of an impression. But Tilda Swinton, 
covers the bases, so it's that's fine. Yeah, it is it is interesting too because it sounds like the roles were kind of flipped because Madame Blanc was kind of like a background player for a lot of the movie in the last one, and now it's the complete opposite where Madame Blanc is the main lead and Madame Tanner is kind of in the back, or I guess Miss Tanner is kind of in the background there. Uh, you don't really see her too often. I kept forgetting that she was actually there. Miss Tanner was. Now it is interesting because both movies begin in the rain and yes. they begin with a troubled girl from the dance academy. Uh, they're still really different. Don't get me wrong, but it, you can still see they're kind of, you know, having this, um, homage in such a way as to draw those parallels. Um, but we do get something different. Instead of having this big opening death scene, it's more of a mystery as to where Patricia went. Now, I'm assuming she's dead, and I'm shocked to find out later that she's not dead. And in some ways, I think that is an interesting choice. Instead of killing these girls off, they're kind of keeping their lifeless bodies around to, I don't know, feast off of or something, to suck the life out of. It's a it's a really dreadful th thought when we come to it. Yeah, and I really like how once Patricia runs off, you don't really see her until Sarah accidentally finds her in the deep catacombs of the Academy. She's never referenced really... I guess she's kind of referenced from Dr. Yosef when he meets with Sarah, but aside from that, you never see her until that last moment uh that it, back when sarah finds her and then later on in the ritual scene it's very interesting that they choose to do this because you it kind of leaves that mystery of well is she is she caught where did she go we find out later that she was she did end up getting caught by the academy and they brought her back so it's very interesting that they chose to not show her get caught and said she just shows up there out of uh, even though we were wondering it so i found that to be very interesting that they chose to handle it that way instead of showing more uh, that found, I found to be very interesting. And Act 1 is over before we know it, and we're on to Act 2, which is called Palace of Tears, which mm -hmm. is a great title. And we one of the prominent things at the beginning of this is the, I thought it was the girls and teachers voting for who they kind of want to be the head of the dance academy, I guess. And that's that is what they want the viewers to think, but I do have the foreknowledge of the coven and then i'm like wait a minute they're voting for who is to be head of the coven yes and uh i thought that was interesting that we are set up with a power struggle here between blanc who is kind of more so the obvious choice to be leader but it does set up marco says oh okay who is this creepy person that we're not going to see until the very end um Blanc seems to be more so the voice of truth where she says, we're not going to call her mother anymore because she's really not the real mother Suspiria. Right. Which I wasn't sure whether to believe or not, but it was still an interesting idea to bring up. Right. Yeah. It, this is also interesting too, because you know, at the very end when uh, Death Incarnate is brought into the room and heads begin exploding, uh, then they have those random shots of the different leaders going Marcos and then their heads explode. Those are the ones who voted for Mother Marcos to be to remain in power in this one scene. Mm -hmm. And I pulled this together on my second watching because I was like, what is this all about? Why are they doing this? And then I realized on the second watching, oh, okay. These are the these are the girls or the women who voted for Mother Marcos to remain in power earlier in the act two. And then yeah, and this sets up that Mother Marcos is trying to be one of the one of the mothers. She thinks that she's one of the three mothers. She wants she really wants to take over the role of Mother Suspiriorum, which we find out she absolutely can't, and due to this, she's also abusing her power. Same with all the, most of the other leaders that are there. Um, they're allowing a lot of things that really are not necessarily morally morally what should be happening um, in this in this dance academy, which then causes Mother Superiorum to come out. That is being Dakota Johnson's character, Susie. That's the whole reason why this movie begins is because there's just an abuse of power in in this dance academy. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why is those who are voting for the Marcos in this opening, they will eventually meet what happens when they choose wrongly, which they do in the very end and they are killed for it. But yeah, in this one scene is very confusing, it comes back a bit later and makes a bit more sense. But yes, this is what's happening is you're right. There is very much a power struggle here. It's between Madame Blanc and, uh, mother's mother Marcos, uh, who are they're trying to find a replacement for like a, a replacement vessel for her to go into after this scene, which is where Susie comes in. Then that kind of explains the whole story here. 
The editing where they right before their heads explode, which was very much reminding me of uh, David Cronenberg's Scanners, where their heads explode in that movie. Um, I was thinking of it almost felt like a kind of a war tribunal, the Nuremberg trials, maybe where the Nazis were on trial, those who sided with Hitler and they were being judged as such. It almost looked like they, how they were shouting and looked like they were in front of a prison, you know, head mugshot or something and in those type of clothes. I don't know. That's just kind of what it was making me think of. Possibly they're trying to draw parallels to the judgment of the post-World War II of the Nazis. Yeah, I could definitely see that them doing that for this reason because this wouldn't, this isn't too long after World War II anyways. And the influence of that war is still very much in effect uh, on Berlin at this time too. We also learned that Patricia wasn't right for the ritual, but they had sent Sarah to kind of um, get Susie to, to be a candidate maybe for the dance Academy that's what they say, but at, I'm a little confused about that because it's almost as if Sarah and Susie had never really met before. I don't know. We're just supposed to get out of this that Susie was chosen. Right. It's, it's, it is, this part is kind of muddy. From what I'm understanding, Susie goes there willingly, goes into the Dance Academy willingly because she did, she mentions to Madame Blanc that she did see a couple of performances from her dance academy at one point and that was what initially drug her to try and join it and mm-hmm. so that's why the reason the whole reason why she's there i think sarah was now she be, now sarah does become one of her good friends here in the academy and i think what was going on here is she makes her she like allows her to stay uh more or less because she finds that she sarah susie finds that sarah is a good friend of hers and that's kept that keeps her on uh, on the academy instead of running off like olga did uh, so I think that's what's going on here is that, yes, Susie came there willingly, but it's Sarah who does kind of keep her there, who it does also try to be her undoing, tries to get her to leave, but mm-hmm. really to no effect there at the very end. Also, Olga plays a significant part in this. And if you'll remember, yes. Olga didn't really play a significant part in the original, aside from hissing in a girl's yeah. face. <laughs> And uh, kind of smoking a Cruella de Vil type cigarette and being a weirdo, essentially. So at least Olga is given more to do here. I did hear that Olga from the original movie did have a bigger part, but it was cut down from the initial scripts. We can't right. really confirm that, though. That's just what the actress says. Now, this kind of plays into why it's called Palace of Tears, because Olga runs off crying and she kind of starts to... Go into this weird trance, uh, kind of this weird alternate state. And she's called into this uh, room where Susie auditioned, where it's just mirrors. And there's kind of this weird, almost uh, voodoo contortion connection where Susie dances in a really dramatic way. It's kind of ripping Olga's body apart. It's a hard scene to watch. It's pretty gross. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, this was a scene where the whole time I'm just like, because one, one of my biggest things is I just I hate broken bones just mm-hmm. in general. Mm-hmm. Broken bones and eyes are my two biggest weaknesses when it comes to something like this. And so seeing this scene I was like, ah, like the whole time I was cringing, just trying not to look away because I didn't want to miss anything because I knew it was important. But also just like, I don't want to watch this. This is one of the scenes I, just, I skipped on my second viewing, mostly because sure. th- I didn't really need to see it again it's like it's like five six minutes long it's long it's a long yeah. sequence but i do know that the actress here is also a per i don't know if she's a professional contortionist but she is a contortionist and so some of these things mm. she was able to do herself now her arm and leg that were twisted into really terrible positions yeah. are prosthetics they're not real uh they did remove her arm and leg in post-production Ooh. but a lot of the other movements that she's able to do she's able to do on her own uh, because she, once again, she's a contortionist, so she's able to do this with herself. There's also one of the witches in the coven who I, I don't know, I just called glasses because she had huge glasses on her face. Yeah. Okay, so we first see her kind of spying on Susie when Susie first comes. In, in the scene, we see Patricia and uh, this glasses witch. They're both crying at the same time. 
I think she has some connection with what with the girls in the academy and I think it's also terrible for her what they're doing she can't take it anymore and that's why she kills herself was that your reading of it yeah that was my reading she doesn't really have that big of a role here and so her actions later on when she does kill herself at the dinner is rather shocking makes a little bit more sense because the abusive power has gotten to a point where she doesn't... By the way, her name is Myth, Miss Griffith. That's her name. Oh. But, uh, yeah, no, I don't think it's stated anywhere in the movie. Regardless, uh, yeah, I'm kind of with you. It's strange, but I kind of picked it up as it went along that she has some kind of connection uh, to these girls and then later kills herself over it because she, I guess she sees that there's really no way out. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a hopeless outlook for this particular witch. Uh, there's probably nothing too redeeming about what she ultimately does. Right. Uh, but I do think it's odd. We also get a shot of Susie peeing in a cup and mm -hmm. remembering her strict Mennonite upbringing. That's kind of like intercut together. And my only guess is why, because we, we did mention urine earlier, why they want all of this stuff, I think that has to do with the ritual of kind of uh, anti-Powerpuff Girls here, sugar spice everything nice. It's not everything nice. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. They are in the same way that Jacob's Ladder was stripping everything away from a main character. They're kind of doing somewhat sim something similar here, too where they have him pee in a bottle for one reason or another. They never really bring up why they do that. I'm sure that there's a great reason for it. They cut their hair later on, especially with Susie and with Patricia, things like that. They essentially are breaking them down subtly without them really realizing it so that way they can have a chance to really get in there and figure out if they're the, re they're the right person to become a vessel for Martha Marcos or whatever reason that they need to. What? You know, you mentioned Susie's hair was cut, and that's absolutely right, but I didn't even think about it. I didn't even realize it. Yeah, it's it's funny because when they do cut her hair, I it's almost as if they didn't cut it enough because it, there's not enough length there to really recognize that she did cut her hair almost. Uh, well, at least in my first ring, I was like, did they actually cut her hair? And I was like, I guess she had longer hair before because it's, it's like – I think it's a bit longer than shoulder length. Oh, they yeah. They didn't cut it. But I... yeah, they don't cut it very much. It's not terribly noticeable. When does the, do they show it? Show her cutting her hair? Yeah, they. It's a th oh, I. I Let me see if I can find it. Because uh, I know I wrote it down. Oh, hmm. well, I'm I'm it's, surprised I didn't notice. Right. So it was before one of the flashbacks. Uh oh. Okay. Yes. Okay. So it's when it's right after the scene when Sarah visits. Okay, so Sarah investigates and goes into the uh, I guess it's, I guess it's considered a matter house. That's probably a bad uh, way of saying it, but <laughs> Sarah goes in and finds one of the hooks that they used. Takes the hook, goes to uh, Doctor Yosef, and then gives it to Doctor Yosef. It's right after this scene was when they cut Susie's hair. Hmm. Um, <laughs> that's the scene when they do it. They briefly mentioned it, and they hope scissors to cut it. And then the next time we see her, her hair is much shorter. Hmm. Okay, wow. I am didn't even think about that, but that's true. Um mm -hmm. I did notice that Dakota Johnson, I I don't I think it's a wig would be my guess. But she does have really beautiful long red hair that if she kind of tilts her head down, it like if she was sitting like on the floor, it would go to the floor. So she does have super long hair. Right. Uh I gosh, okay. I, she does cut her hair, that's true. Um there is a weird shot, though. I don't know if it's even worth mentioning, though. It's like a close-up shot of Susie with her face and then Blanc in the bathroom coming out of the bathroom after they're eating dinner. It's such a short take, but it's too short for us to really enjoy, I felt. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I don't it's just, I know. There's just that a number way. of takes in this movie where it's like, oh, that's cool. Oh, it's gone. Okay, yeah. what are we trying to what are we trying to do here? You know, except just be different. I don't know. Right. Well, but the speaking of being different, the uh, nightmare scenes mm -hmm. are rather different. I will say this: I really do enjoy them. Uh, for the most part, I f 
I do wonder how much they play into the story, aside from them just being nightmares and everyone gets them, and that Madame Blanc is the one who essentially subsides all of those later in the movie. Yeah. I thought that same thing. I, it was a really well composed and cut dream sequence. Right. And it was an intriguing hook, literally. <laughs> Not literally, yeah. actually, figuratively. We do get those when they're hook. Uh, Olga, who I thought was dead, that was pretty disturbing, also. Oh, yes. Uh, it's a really intriguing way to end Act Two. And I did feel like they might be kind of taking some. Not necessarily the nightmarish imagery, but more so how it's edited from maybe uh, the old, well-regarded Italian director, Federico Fellini, uh, such as his film, Juliet of the Spirits. I've seen that. There's some kind of interesting editing choices with that. Um, Also, it, it makes us question whether Susie was punished in such ways as having her hand ironed for like just breaking a piece of glass. Yeah, I was wondering if that was the reason why. Um, one of the other things I wondered if that wasn't their per punishment is for breaking glass is more due to the fact that Madame Blanc is always shown in a reflection. Or not always, but a lot of the time she's shown in some kind of reflection somewhere mm-hmm. or is looking out a window somewhere. So my guess is uh, it doesn't necessarily have to do with Susie breaking the glass, but something much different than that. And that this part where her mom takes her hand and uh, smashes an iron over it is something that actually happened in her childhood when she was younger. And part of her part of her nightmare of her own mother doing that to her back in the day. Um, it's th- these are very cryptic when it comes to reading them. Uh, you can I can still draw some parallels here and there, but I think that they are going to involve uh, more studying to understand what they're really going for here. It also made me think of the Ring videotape. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. I can see it. But then we go on to Act 3. We are about halfway through now, which is called Borrowing. And we come to find out the police are involved, but they are quickly humiliated. And also, I did want to mention, although the Dance Academy isn't visually intriguing like the original... Its humongous labyrinthian structure is appealing. It visually yes. conveys they there are many dark secrets hidden within this cavernous structure. So I I do like that part of it. Right. Yeah. The it is interesting. I do know that they uh, this dance academy is a hotel. It's an old grand hotel that was abandoned a while back. That was up in the mountains, and they found it, and they were like, "Oh, it's perfect." And from what I understand, and from what I read, it wasn't very great to record there because it was very cold being up the mountains and it didn't have correct heating um so there you go the dance academy part of it which is takes up most of the movie uh now now obviously some of this could very well just been sets that were not in the grand hotel but at least this lobby is pretty much shot on location here uh i guess not on location but shot there's nothing really added onto it. It's very much a real presence, not a, not a set or anything that they would have built. We also learned they are starting a new dance piece about rebirths called Open Again. Well, if that isn't um, quite heavy foreshadowing, then I don't know what is. Yes. And uh, I mean, like, it is at the time, but then in like retrospect, that is even more so a really big thing. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of heavy foreshadowing in this movie when patricia comes in and starts like rambling to dr yosef basically everything that she says is foreshadowing something later on in the story which okay it makes sense it's act one we're setting things up i can get by that but this is one of the one of the times where they use foreshadowing that uh is very heavy-handed that's later on in the movie where they say yeah we're gonna do a dance about rebirth which later on in the story they're at the very end of the climax makes a ton more sense while Susie is dancing, she's more so just writhing, honestly. She seems to activate what I believe to be Marcos. We see this black hand, which is yes. similar to the original. Come to find out that's not Marcos at all. Alan says that's death incarnate. I'll save my thoughts towards the end what I think this might be. I, I don't disagree. It, it probably is. But I read it just a little bit differently. We can discuss that at the yeah. end. Yeah. And yeah, the, 
I guess it is kind of hard to say if this hand is Death Incarnate or Mother Marcos. I took it as Mother Marcos. Could be either one, I suppose, though. But either way, everyone, Mother, 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 my mother, Madame Blanc, Miss Tanner, all the other leaders are looking around and saying that there's there's something here with this girl, something special about her. And we will come to find out later that there very much is. Um. Okay, I wanted to know your thoughts about the very slow buildup of the witches. We get quite a few shots of them just kind of sitting around and talking about their plans. And I think it does work to provide intrigue and mystery. But at the same time, I think we might spend a bit too much time of them just probably sitting around talking about stuff. Right. That part doesn't bother me too much that they're sitting around a lot uh, because it's no secret past act i i figured it out before act one was over but if once they get to this moment when the two are talking uh man black i think it's i want to say it's miss tanner but i can't remember who it is and they're reading the newspapers and they're talking about Susie. at this moment there's really no other there's really no other explanation than to say that they are witches at this point uh and that they're trying to re they're trying to re they're trying to take Susie and use her that's not a mystery at all. They're they're they basically stated outright here in the scene. And what's interesting is that in the original uh, in the original Suspiria, that was always the mystery. That are they witches? Are they actually doing what they're what? Uh, I guess it would have been yeah. Are they actually doing what Patricia said that they are doing? Is Sarah correct? Things like that. And so the mysteries have been switched. Where now it's the question of well, is uh is Susie going to be the one who falls prey to what they want or is she going to become, or is she going to be able to resist it? Which kind of changes there at the very end. But upon hindsight and looking back, this is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why I wouldn't say watch it a second time, at least not close together, because you know everything that's going to happen and it makes the movie not as scary and not as intriguing as before. It didn't bother me at first, but the more I look back on it, the more I'm just like, yeah, well... Yeah, I already know all this stuff. You can almost skip some of these scenes because you there's, at this point it's just general knowledge to know that what their plan is and what they're trying to do. Yeah, that's what I'm driving at is I feel like we almost spend maybe a little too much time on their plan or them kind of explaining background details or what they think of the coven. Yeah, we get it. I'd prefer for us to more so get to that point instead of being them just talking about it so much. Um right. Also, we find out that uh, all of these girls have had bad dreams, and I think the reason is they send all of the girls' dreams to see which one is more so a viable candidate who will yeah. accept those dreams kind of of their own volition, uh, which I think we could maybe even talk a little bit more about the character of Susie herself. I feel that Susie is underdeveloped. Also, we yeah. don't see much of a... I think every character, especially a main character, needs to have some kind of questioning or some kind of struggle, whereas Susie seems to just kind of give herself over to this. It seems to be at first she's very unsuspecting, but then eventually... She seems to kind of accept it more and more, so it's not like she doesn't have any free will in the matter. I was just disappointed we didn't explore the character of Susie as much, and she seemed to just be a little too passive with some of these things that are happening to her. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, she's rather underdeveloped. I wa that's why I, I kind of wondered if maybe if they had made the story about Sarah, maybe it would have been a bit more intriguing main character-wise. In the grand scheme of things, it makes sense why we follow Susie because, once again, she becomes she comes out and says, "Oh yeah, I'm Mother Suspiriorum," and that becomes the whole coven's undoing. So in that context, it makes sense. But you're all you are correct. She is rather underdeveloped in this story, which is unfortunate because in the original, don't get me wrong, the characters were still rather shallow. But it made a little bit more. It, it felt a bit more intriguing because Susie, the mystery was there of is Susie going to fall prey to these people or is she going to resist them? Which she ultimately does resist them. 
uh, there at the very end. With this, she just it sound it looks like she just continues to slip downwards uh, into the arms of what they of the of the uh, it, she continues to slip downwards into the arms of Madame Blanc and the other leaders around her. There really is no resistance. There really is no, no, like you were saying, questioning here going on. That's all done by Sarah, Patricia, and Olga, who are very much side characters. Uh, at least Sarah has a bit more development to her. But I will agree with you. It's uh, there. She is not very developed, more than probably she should have been. I do believe Dakota Johnson does a fairly good job with yeah. the material that she's given. And she does some really amazing dance sequences, but I just wish it would have gone beyond that. Yeah, I'm absolutely with you. I, I think she does a fine job, but I don't. I don't think it's really her fault that her character ended up this way. It's more yeah. of a scripting kind of a thing because, like I said, they there just needed to be more development here. To that way, she felt a bit more real because maybe it's even part of the point is that she doesn't feel as real as other characters do, like Sarah, but. That is, a, okay. that is a storytelling issue nonetheless. Why do the witches want Dr. Yosef to be a witness to their ritual? What? It Well, we get the witches talking about how they want to use Dr. Yosef as a witness to their ritual. My only guess is they just kind of want to they – they hate men. They want to punish men. And they want him to just show like, oh, you you think we're something to be like investigated? No, we'll show you. We'll show you our real power and humiliate you because you're naked there and you'll just see how terrifying and powerful we are. That's my only yeah. guess. I don't think it's really explained very well. Yeah, they briefly explain why they want him there. They they, they do figure out that that he was helping Patricia. Uh I'm guessing after this is around the time they captured her. But, yeah, it is interesting to ask the question, why would they want him? My guess is he knows too much, and this he's just kind of part of... He's, just, he's, being, he's becoming a victim in a way that he really didn't do much anything wrong, but they're abusing their power just to bring him in because they can, and he's affected by it there, especially at the very end. So my guess is... Uh, it's more of just he's seen too much now we have to take care of him kind of a thing and them abusing their power even more so here to bring him in and I, I'm guessing they're probably their original plan was probably to kill him off there uh, before Mother Suspiriorum decides to reveal herself and then twist the tides there okay I gotta know what do you think of Dr. Yosef's plot because it's not even really a subplot, I would say. It's almost a second plot to this. Or There's like two main plots to this movie. He has a lot of mm-hmm. screen time. We learned more about his background almost, it feels like, than Susie's. Oh, yes. And there's just so much. They play him up so much. He's such a major character and a major plot point. How do you feel that worked in this movie? I was wondering if he would, if he was going to be the guy, like uh, essentially the savior of of Susie here, where he is the one who unveils everything that the that the academy is doing. He unveils uh, how evil they really are, and eventually saves Susie there at the very end. Uh, basically, the object of uh, the object of good, which he is, he is very much the uh, the object of good, but in a much different way. He's more of the object of good, but also in the vein of innocence, because he's not necessarily somebody who really gets involved too much into the inner workings of this uh, of the coven. He's just a victim there at the very end of what happens. So I do enjoy his story because I think it's very much needed for somebody to really try and go against what their goal, what the coven is going for, and also play up how the coven reacts to this, more so than Sarah, who is doing it on the inside, and how they're really good at masquerading this coven is but i do feel that i do wish that they did more with him because i think he's a very intriguing character but kind of like Susie, he's not given too much to work with that is super intriguing aside from his initial story i wish they would have done a bit more with him yeah i would definitely agree with you especially in the fact that with a character that we actually open with and who is given so much screen time and so much backstory about how he always felt unresolved. He never found his wife and he still goes to 
their old house to kind of reminisce. And we even get shots of him, of them when they were younger. And he does a lot of investigating and he spends time with these detectives talking about how you helped me look for my wife from the concentration camp and he survived the Holocaust. I'm just, I guess one of my frustrations is I feel like it doesn't sync up with the rest of the movie well enough to make them feel like compatible parallel plots per se i guess um yeah i guess that was probably my biggest issue with it is if we're going to spend this much time with this character then there has to be a solid payoff and i feel like we don't have that solid payoff you're right we do need some force of good not everybody can be evil or vanquished by this evil presence of the coven but in the end his memories are erased because Susie feels bad for him and he doesn't deserve to have horrible memories so she makes him forget about every single woman he ever knew including his housekeeper I think it's just I think it's just the women who were that he came in contact with like Olga no uh, Patricia or Sarah and everything that had to do with the coven and yeah, but I don't he doesn't think they got know. rid of the memory of his wife, though. Well, but he doesn't but, even know his housekeeper, though. Right. It's very possible that they got rid of every woman. It, but from what they were saying, it was just going to be the basically anything that had to do with the coven, which I guess probably could also extend to his wife because they do create an apparition of his wife at one point. It's very cryptic. I don't know. I don't know. I, I personally felt it was just unfulfilling i I didn't find it satisfying yeah i i found that to be more of since he was he was very much a victim to a point where it just wasn't didn't even make any sense for him to have these kind of terrible memories so they erased it so modus superior erased it from him so he wouldn't feel that guilt and shame because the guilt and shame is not meant for him it's it's meant for the leaders that are doing these things here uh then since he didn't abuse his power, he doesn't need to, he shouldn't need to feel that kind of stuff. But he, and so she erases those, mem- those memories of from him. It's. Strange. I guess I'll. I guess I'll go so far as to say that, overall, looking back at it and looking at his entire plot, I feel it's pretty much unnecessary. They could have excised him from the plot, and I think we would have gotten the same result. I think he's just they spend way too much time on him. And it doesn't pay off, which I'm I'm disappointed yeah. with. I wouldn't say that much. I would say that he's definitely important to have as like an outside force because, let's face it, aside from him, nothing really from the outside ever gets into the inside aside from him. Uh, but you are correct. I do wish they did just more with him, like made him more intriguing, I guess you could say, because his story, although very important in my mind, I think that they should have done more to make it a bit more grounded to the rest of the story, uh, especially in terms of how it plays out. But what does he really accomplish as an outside force? That's what I'm left with is he's really, I feel like he doesn't really accomplish anything, especially once his memories are erased. To me, it's just all far too confusing and they're just trying to put too many things in here and accomplish so much that I think they really missed the mark. And the final shot is, his house, I'm assuming this has to be years into the future when the Soviet Union has fell because people are vibrant and living there right. now. And it zooms in on that old thing where he kept – I guess that's really supposed to mean something. It didn't mean anything to me. Yeah, I, I just took that as maybe the memory of his wife. It has something to do with his wife, his old wife. And then she, now, of course, she is dead at this point. We It is revealed to us that his wife did die and that the – the girl that she that he saw earlier was more of an apparition than it was anything else. Yeah. But well, that was a good yeah. twist. But I do agree; it's it's confusing, nonetheless, that they end with that shot uh, for a character that was really only a side character. I'm sure that there was a good intention for it, but I don't know what it would be for. I don't know. Well, I, I really think they just missed the mark with trying to convey some emotional resonance anyways we're about to transition into act four but before that we get some more dreams these times this time more horrifying than the last and my only parallel is uh it's kind of reminiscent of uh alejandro jordakowski's the holy mountain which i don't recommend you watch listeners i just brought that up because that has some really 
no, it has it's nightmarish, but in a completely different way. So that's the only thing I can draw the connection right. to is how odd they're shot, especially the opening of that movie where it's kind of this weird religious wannabe spiritual sequence, and it kind of makes me think of that. I have no doubt Luca has seen that movie and taken some from right. that. Yeah, this is a much more stranger than the last one. It's it, This one has a bit more of a sexual undertone to it where the lady is going to stab herself, I'm guessing more for infertility. Uh, you see a worm in the underwear or worm next to the underwear, things like that. There is much more of that kind of stuff in this one, more so than the, than the last one. Uh, so once again, I, I think that this has, this makes for me a, a bit more sense applying to this idea of motherhood than it would trying to apply it to just being standalone. Uh, I can see where this more of an art form of some uh, seemingly random shots begin to tie together and make something a bit more. Because at the very end of this, too, she does uh, scream out, I know who I am, which we will find out later who she really is. But, yeah, these scenes are... These scenes are weird. We also see the shimmer on the wall and in different sections, yes. which really made me think of... A ghost story. Yes. It did. Uh, my interpretation is that Shimmer is the spirit of Mother Suspiria. Yeah, that's what I'm guessing, too. Uh, it, it shows up, I think, every dream sequence she has, and then later on leads her down this hallway to enter then to the, the ritual chamber. And you brought up leading her down the hallway. That has to be almost a direct lift from Sleeping Beauty where Sleeping Beauty is seeing this green ball of light lead her to the hidden chambers of the castle to, you know, kill her essentially from the Queen Maleficent. Right. So I'm like, oh, that that is such a direct reference to that, which makes sense because Sleeping Beauty is a fairy tale and the original Suspiria was kind of a dark fairy right. tale. And I can see them probably bringing some of those elements into this as well. Right. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Okay, what do you think of the emblem? Because during Act 4, with each title sequence, there's that kind of like little emblem, almost a border, I guess. And it first starts under the title, then it moves to the bottom of the screen for like Act 3, and then for Act 4, um, well, it takes up the bottom of the screen. Act 5, it takes up the side, and then it just kind of like disappears and doesn't do much. So I didn't get what they are trying to say with that. Yeah, I, I wonder this too, because... I knew that from when I saw Act 2, I saw the title card for Act 2, I was like, okay, so they're probably going to be building up this border around the screen for each of these acts. But aside from maybe, I don't really know. I, I'm guessing aside from maybe having something to do with the ritual, I, I'm not entirely sure what it would be symbolizing aside from maybe just progression through, through the actual yeah. length of the story. I mean, I guess I just found it to be disappointing because I thought, okay, that's kind of good. They're showing the progression of the sequence, and then ultimately the sequence will be complete with what I assume will happen in the end. But then they just drop it, yeah. and they don't. I'm like, what are you trying to do here? Like, It could also be related don't. to uh, the way – or the uh, the information that Dr. Yosef is, being, is figuring out here as well because the beginning he has a very short – like almost a like comb-like uh, – whatever it is underneath the title. And then as, as it progresses, it begins to fill up the screen more and more. And then, and the epilogue where it's erased, it's just back to that single bar again. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, I don't know, makes me wonder, did he learn anything? His memories erased. What did we learn? Did we really learn nothing except of the inevitable? I don't know. It's just one of those odd choices. Uh, one of the choices that I did felt that was right that they made here was there's this uh, shot of Blanc circling Susie in their big dance yes. hall, which is causing Susie to like spin around to look at, at her, which gives Blanc power over Susie and putting Susie in a position of vulnerability. That's a really nice shot and really nice conveyance of the power right. struggle. I think it's probably, from what I can remember, the best shot of the movie. And I'm a little disappointed that 
just like I said, once again, with the unevenness of the choices of these shots or what they're trying to convey, and even at times, some of these shots are just boring. I mean, there's really just not much to them at all. And for a movie that is trying to convey these, you know, um, positions of power or, you know, just foreboding forbearance, things like that, I don't know. This what this shot was really good, but some of these other shots are not creative. I'm just disappointed with the unevenness right. of it all. I, that didn't bother me at all. I found the cinematography just all across the board to be very, really, really good. Much different than Call Me By Your Name. It's not as, I guess, picturesque as that movie would be. It's very much meant to be portraying more than more of a message than anything else. Like in this shot you were mentioning, where uh, where Martin Blanc is circling Susie. It's short, but it palpably displays this the, this uh, position of power and vulnerability on in terms of Susie's part. Uh, because in this scene, she offers that because she can't get the jumps high enough. And so she offers, well, if we see it near the ground, then it can convey something else. And Madame Blanc says, that's not how this works. And begins to circle her and asking her questions and essentially showing her why they decided to do it this way. Uh, just puts her, puts Susie in a position where she feels rather powerless uh, and she can't do too much about it. And she has kind of forced, if she wants to play the part of the protagonist, to learn to get these jumps right. I never really found, in terms of cinematography, I never really found it to be all that bad, really, at any, any spot. I found it to be very intriguing, uh, for the most part, just much different than other movies would have portrayed it. I found it to be very, very good overall. When Dr. Yosef meets up with Sarah to talk about the disappearance of Patricia, he says, Delusion is a life that tells the truth. Okay, I was thinking about this. To me, this is one of those sayings that is trying to be really profound, but really isn't. There's really not much to this here. Delusion, because delusion is contradictory to the truth. The truth is not a delusion. Maybe in this movie that is correct, though, where all of these people are delusional maybe about their their power and i don't know i'm probably trying to explain it away for and not really get to any real point here to me this just seemed like one of those isms that really just wasn't true yeah that's my guess is it's a saying that that she made up just to pull Susie even farther because it is an interesting saying to have her say Something that religion is just sharing your delusion with others. It's a weird saying. My guess is it's a false saying for the purposes of being false, but to come out as true to pull Susie in even farther. Well, and then we do learn more about Sarah finds their hidden lair, just like she counts the steps in the other one and goes behind right. the mirror. And then the doctor explains to her about the three mothers and then somehow the doctor knows about the power struggle between Blanc and Marcos. How in the world does he know that? Well, my guess is it came from Patricia's diary because he does have that. And that does explain a lot of the inner workings of the dance Academy. So I'm guessing that and what caused him to get it, get it interested in all this in the first place is because of Patricia and her leaving her diary there with him. Uh, he's now, kind of figuring out now how Patricia found this out I don't know it doesn't never explain why how she knew that assuming that he did read this from her journal but that's just what I'm getting I mean I, I my interest is peaked especially when Sarah sees behind the door which is kind of like when the one lady sees behind the the blue iris which she wasn't supposed to see my interest is peaked right. now will i be fulfilled in what we find out eh, we'll see but nevertheless they're doing a good job at building up my interest and then we move on to act five which isn't as long it's in the mutter house or all the floors are darkness um and then this is the dance part of the movie which i think right. may be my favorite part of the movie uh, the dance is so well done. This is such a great sequence. Yeah, and this is the scene when we really kind of figure out what is not fully, but it brings a big chunk 
uh, into what is really going on here. Patricia is still alive. Uh, I'm guessing that was Olga who wakes up and starts screaming in the hallway and Sarah runs off. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we know that the witches that are there who are running the coven can, I kind of already know that she's in there and cause these holes to open up in the ground and break her, uh, break her leg, all kinds of stuff. There's a big chunk here that was taken out of the mystery where uh, we are finding out more and more and more and realize that Patricia is very much still alive here and that they're, probably waiting for an opportune time to use her and that now that really anybody who goes against the coven is going to end up in the same way that uh patricia did and now sarah yeah i was really surprised to find out patricia was still alive she looked like the girl from the exorcist i thought yeah she is hardly recognizable aside from uh uh for aside from sarah saying her name yeah this is a good scene that lends to, well, the whole sequence lends to the fact of kind of the coalescing of the dancers and how they'll kind of later on be, they, they've they really been molded and finally shaped into the vassal of the coven, whether, whether they realize it or not, that right. this is all kind of leading up to um, the ritual. And of course, Susie plays, what does she call it, the hero or the protagonist? Yeah, protagonist. Which I'm not really sure if maybe the movie thinks she's the protagonist, but to me she would kind of see like an be like more of an anti um protagonist or more so I guess almost the antagonist because of her dark role to come. I suppose I can see where they bring in that role of the protagonist here because she's very much the one who does the cleansing of the corrupt power here in in this in this coven of witches that was her whole role is in a much different way she's the one who brings them out of power kills them basically the ones who are corrupt and keeps the ones that aren't corrupt still in the coven and they continue to do their thing so in some ways yes she is the protagonist but i would say in a much the protagonist is typically somebody who is portrayed or is believed to be good uh that that's not necessarily what the definition is. The protagonist is more of just one side of the story that we follow, and the antagonist is the person that goes against that. Right. Well, in the movie, they come out and call her the protagonist. That's her part in the dance. Yes. And that's what I'm trying to kind of get at, I guess, is does this movie – I believe this movie is saying she is the protagonist, as in she is the good guy or good gal. But to me, I don't believe that's really the case. It's it's hard to say because I don't know if – it's hard to say if that's what the movie is saying is that she's a good person or bad person here. I think it's just more of saying that she's the good person in terms of removing all of the corrupt power. Maybe not in the best way. Just getting rid of the bad parts, the uh, the bad, the worst parts of the academy is really her entire role here. Is just to cleanse it and make it not as I guess bad as it was before. Or it was corrupt, right? And well, we'll talk about whether I think that's really the case or not here in a little bit. Whether we both yeah. think that or not, but we do get finally to the final act, say for the epilogue, which is called Suspiriorum. And in a way, I feel like I'm surprised we're here already because I feel like we just haven't had that much solid food to chew on throughout the movie to so like to justify getting to Act 6 already. But then at the same time, this movie is so long, but I'm just wondering if they use their time wisely to get us here. Right. Yeah, this is another one of those really long – there are a, a number of just – really long sequences in this movie. And this is one of the longest here is this, as this, uh, I guess technically this, well, in the, in the three act structure, this would be act three. This is act six. This is a more of a six act structure with six act structure with a, with an epilogue to it. Uh, somewhat like Patterson that I mentioned, I felt it was more of a seven act structure. This is kind of the same way. It doesn't follow that typical three act structure. This is very much the climax though, right here. This is when, Everything is revealed. Uh, we get to, there. Really, is no mystery left aside from what's going to happen with uh, Doctor Yosef. And did you notice Susie putting on the black glove? That has to be a nod to the black gloves the killers wore in the Three Mothers movies. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. 
And I was really pleased to see Jessica Harper got a cameo. She plays An- Anke. I think yep. that's how you say it. Um, she is the long lost wife of Dr. Yosef, who I believe to be real, actually, uh, until you come to find out it was all an illusion in order to lead him to the dance academy, which I completely forgot they wanted to do. And then they come running, like growling at him. Yeah. I, I thought that was a nice twist. Yeah. And this is interesting, too, because I actually didn't know it was Jessica Harper at all. Mm. And then when I looked it up and saw that she had put a cameo and that she was, ooh, that she put a cameo and that she was Anka, I was like, really? And then when I watched it again, I saw it. I was like, oh, okay. I see it now. To be fair, she is much older than what she was in 1977. But yes, this is a very interesting twist where it come to find out. And also it's foreshadowing for her when we find out later that she really is dead. Um that she's very much an apparition. She's not real. And she leads uh, Dr. Yosef to the dance academy and he's grabbed and brought inside. And they take this, they take the, uh, the hook away from him and they begin stripping him down for the ritual. They, they do just that. And we are here. We're ready for the ritual, which I've been intrigued to see how they'll handle it. I got to say, I'm not surprised with all the nudity. Of course, it seems like every witch ritual has to be, they have to be naked. Like in the end of the witch, they had to be naked. Uh, So (laughs) yeah, that's, that's quite a bit of that, but we do get some of it through a red filter. So it's not probably as as graphic as it could be, despite it being pretty graphic. We get some pretty gross stuff here as well, seeing uh, Marcos naked, but she had so much prosthetics and makeup on. I was able to kind of avert my eyes as much as I could. She's she's definitely not a looker. No, no, she's not. <laughs> they also pull out Sarah's intestines. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Most of this doesn't make any sense to me except to kind of terrify me and freak me out. And it's important to note Blanc does give Susie an out, but Susie doesn't want to get out. Right. It's almost as if she's uh, fallen so far that she doesn't feel like she has as much of a reason to leave. Once again, there is a reason why she feels that. And it's right not long after she says that when it's revealed who she really is, but not after mother Marcos tries to execute, uh, Madame Blanc, but does so kind of unsuccessfully. Okay. Alan, give me your thoughts on this ending ritual here. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> the, okay. I could get, I could watch the rest of this movie aside from this scene and be fine with it, especially after a second viewing. I mentioned this earlier. This movie is kind of begins to drag more because you there's not much of a mystery here, especially on the second viewing. Once again, could just be because I watched it within the same week. That aside, this is an extremely heavy ending here uh, compared to a lot of other horror movies that I've seen one of the heavier ones uh, that I think I've seen in a long while, but it is interesting that they bring out Susie and she turns out to be mother Suspiriorum, which we, there really is no hardly any build up to it there at the very end. She, and that was what confused me at first is when I was reading the plot summary on Wikipedia to get this prepared that I found that she really is mother Suspiriorum. And I was like, huh? And I was confused. And then I, I began to piece it together. They don't do a very good job at explaining that. But she brings up Death Incarnate, uh, according to Wikipedia, which we did see in Inferno, a, a brief moment. And uh, she begins killing all of those who are basically following Marcos. And so what I'm seeing here is that she's very much cleansing. No, cleansing in, in ways of she's getting rid of the corrupt power compared to what is supposed to be going on here. Uh, with most superior and she becomes the head leader of the dance academy more or less to do what they're supposed to do the correct way that they're supposed to do it not in the way that mother marcos does it in that that being just kind of abusing their own power uh then she grants uh olga and uh sarah and patricia a more painless death than having their heads explode and they just kind of slump over and it's it's extremely heavy. And then at the very end, you see her. She's like, yes, dance is beautiful. Dance, dance, you know. 
And then it eventually cuts away, and that song comes back here, which I, I don't feel is the best choice, but I mean it works for what we're going for here. And yeah, it's it's heavy. It's extremely heavy. So when you were first watching it, did you immediately think that? I thought that creature looked like Bagul from Sinister. I didn't see that much. Bagul is a bit cleaner <laughs> than well, this one is. Yeah, I guess I just but... meant the face. It's kind of all. Yeah, I can see that. Stretch or something. Okay, but I was wondering, did you think it was death personified when you first watched it? What did you think? I thought I thought it was the actual Mother Suspiriorum that came out or something else. Uh, I had no idea what this was until I looked it up. Okay, that's – I'm, I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to stick with that is the real Mother Suspiria – and I'm going to try and lay out here what I perceive as what they're trying to do here at the end, kind of the storytellers, what they're playing off of here. So we get Susie and this creature and also that shimmering light behind her. And Marcos is executed because she is more or less a false prophet. She is more or less almost you could say an antichrist per se where she has right. been leading everybody astray as to who she really is okay now we get those three beings that i said which to me seem to be an inversion of the trinity instead of the father son holy spirit we get the mother daughter and spirit and it calls into question whether this was Susie's more so unholy destiny from her birth because her mom said earlier that Susie was her sin that she brought into the world. She was attracted to this dance academy from youth and she was always doing bad things. We don't really know much about that, but that almost makes me think of she's this Christ figure, but not in a good sense. She's, like I said, more of an inversion of the Christ figure where from birth this was her destiny to grow up so at the end i saw the real mother suspiria come out she has her daughter they're one and the same come together and then we have this spirit so the three of them are truly one being and they're kind of executing this unholy judgment it seemed like also when susie's like peeling back her chest and bringing that apart that seemed to me to be kind of this unholy transfiguration. We know in the Gospels, Christ, there was like a unveiling, like a lifting of the eyes where three of Christ's disciples saw his true form. Well, when that happens, a red comes across the screen and Susie says, I'm her. And we're hearing the words unmade playing in the background. Also, we hear the lyrics come under my wings, little bird, which to me made me think of when Jesus looked at Jerusalem and said, if I could have all gathered you under my wings, I, I would have. Um, also, okay, when she goes to those three or so, and she asks them what they wish after exploding everyone's heads, they wish for death, which was just really dark and dreadful to watch and sit through. To me, this once again seems more like an inversion where people would come to Christ and they would ask to be healed. This they're asking to die. So all of this seemed just really kind of dark and unholy and just kind of a really morally bankrupt inversion of the Trinity there. Yeah, it's this is one of really this entire movie is kind of shredded in so much mystery that you can read 40 different things out of different scenes. And so I could definitely see where you're getting at with all of this and how you see all of that. Uh, I, I still see the power struggle, but I can definitely see where the, like this whole unholy Trinity can come into play so easily with this ending. Uh, yeah. Regardless of how you interpret it, I, so this is what I'm wondering. I think the filmmakers are seeing this as this redemptive ending. I, I don't see it that way. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really seeing – I'm not sure if redemption is much of the right word as as it is removing corruption. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to say redemption because typically redemption comes with the idea that they did something wrong before and they know it and they're trying to fix it. 
it's now here it's more of just removing the corrupt powers that are in play which is mother marcos and her followers which she's one she briefly mentions that she's kind of wanting to be one of the three mothers or is trying to re, trying to show herself as one of the three mothers here and have people worship her that way uh that could once again bring the parallel to an antichrist figure of her uh i'm not sure if re- like i said i'm not sure if redemption is the correct word for this kind of a story more so than it is just removing corrupt power I guess maybe not redemption, but more so they're trying to depict all of this in a positive, beautiful way. Whereas I'm sad that Susie has given into this evil, but I think we're not supposed to be sad. I think we're supposed to be like, wow, she's, this is, this is great. This is how it was supposed to be all along. I think the filmmakers are trying to say this is a positive ending. I never got that sense either, though, that they were trying to say it's super positive. It's still got that – it still has that emotion of great sadness to it uh, and great despair, but not so much to the fact that, oh, this is good. More so uh, to the fact that it's bad, but not as bad as it was before. I never got the sense that this is meant to be a super good thing. Much better than was before, maybe, but not good in the in, not good overall. Well, do you see it as a cautionary tale then? Yeah, I can see it as a cautionary tale uh, saying that corrupt power, this is what's going to happen eventually to corrupt power. It's going to eventually fall over by somebody else's undoing. Uh, I can see that. This, let's be honest here. There really isn't too much of a message as much in this movie there are certain things that can be much very much perceived as a message but what i'm seeing there isn't much of a message here that would elicit a lot of other thoughts that i could have i guess sure it's very much a story that's meant to be oh here's something spooky with some sprinkle of a message here and there Right. Well, when they are saying you need to give up your mother and accept this new mother, I can't help but see a parallel between the Trinity and between this. I perceive this, I can't help but perceive this anyway as an unholy Trinity and as this more so reign of darkness. I don't even see it as cleansing corruption. I just see the whole thing as corrupt and dark and really void of any any type of it's like a dark salvation if that makes sense yeah. which is not really any true salvation in and of itself it's more so a lie regardless to say i don't like this ending it did leave me with not just because of what we see here but just because it's it's so melancholic it's so sad here um that's the way at least i felt and i know other reviewers felt that way as well um, yeah. Okay, what did you think, though, of how it was shot, like it was filmed with that weird slow-motion handheld cam and zooming in on stuff? Yeah, they. Uh, so this is not nothing new to this movie. They have, I don't, I forget the correct term for it, uh, but from what I remember of my own memory, it's called strobe. Essentially, uh, frames last a bit longer than what you'd see, so it gives, this frame is much lower. Mm. So... That when she's walking around and she's her she's kind of jittering around and stuff like that, that's what's going on here. And so that didn't bother me too much. This is if you watch this movie in the seventies, you could almost mistake it as a movie that came from that era. They do a pretty do a pretty good job at making it feel as if it came from the seventies. Uh, but yeah, it's a very strange effect that they use more than one time. This trouble effect and a lots of and there's a lot of handheld cam, which is interesting because we don't really ever see much handheld cam anywhere else in the story. So it it kind of makes it feel as if now we're a bit more grounded. We're not not necessarily that we're in control, but that somebody else has control of the camera now. They take it off the tripod and they're using it the way that they want to. And she's walking around the uh, the room and is giving Olga, the three girls, uh, the peaceful death. And then eventually it has this really wide shot of everyone else dancing and those who are dead are dead. And then she's kind of sitting in the middle of it all. And so it gives it a, a bit more of a, I guess, personal touch to it, I guess is not really the best term to put, but it's, I guess, a better definition uh, than anything else I can think of because it is very much handheld and strobe and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it's really gruesome there. But in yeah. some ways, I I think the like aesthetic aspect of it is well done. I thought they aesthetically handled the scene well, even though it is really weird. But that's probably the yeah. only positives I can 
give that is visually but otherwise yeah gosh i i'm not hankering to watch that scene ever again <laughs> yeah i'm with you <laughs> okay so finally we are at the epilogue which i thought the movie was just going to end right there because so did i and i thought i would have sworn that uh dr yosef was gonna die which yeah they let him go which is, actually did surprise me yeah uh I'm really surprised they made these story choices with this epilogue here because I was – gosh, they created such a mood with that scene and then bam, it is killed so fast, at least to me, when we cut to epilogue, a sliced up pear. Right. And they're leading – one of the old ladies is singing, leading Dr. Yosef on his way. Um, Madame Blanc is still alive, which – I can't even understand why they would show that except to set it up for a sequel, which I always hate when they show this character still alive for the end. It just gives me horrible flashes of Transformers, like Revenge of the Fallen or something, when you find out Megatron is still right. alive. And I'm like, what? Don't, don't do well, this. To be, to be fair, do to be fair, uh, her death that was supposed to come came from other Marcos and she's still alive. So there is that to consider. I just feel like we're doing a lot of stuff that's really unnecessary here at the end. Yeah, I, I guess it, I guess it is going to show that uh, her intentions were not as malicious as Mother Marcos's were, and so she was still able to live uh, past the ritual. Also, could be a setup for a sequel because I know that I think <laughs> that there were talks here and there of possibly there being one. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's. Like I said, that's why I'm showing it's I'm telling you they're supposed to be like it's supposed to be like graceful and she is gracious and kind. Um, but it's in just a dark way that we shouldn't like think is good or glorify at all. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they're cleaning up the ritual room. The girls are still alive. I'm kind of annoyed that we are having to watch this because uh, I feel like they're just not ending it the way that they set it up to end. Um, okay. So, Alan, what did we, we kind of already talked about Susie and Dr. Yosef and their meeting. Yes. At, at this point, honestly, I'm, I'm just kind of wanting the movie to be over though. Yeah. My second viewing, I did watch this scene cause I wanted to make sure I got all my notes right, but you are correct. Uh, it is an interesting scene to have in here. Because it does go on for a long time, and they take a while to explain things here too. Uh, okay, so I'm I'm kind of also wondering because to me this almost seems like this is a different Susie. It's more so we could say almost the transfigured or resurrected Susie, and this time, okay, let me rephrase that. So. Like I was trying to compare earlier Susie to a a Christ-ish figure in their own way. Well, instead of having a mother because she rejected the mother, she possibly could be coming to visit her father who uh, – and we know at the time of Christ's death, Mary was there. Well, who was the name of Christ's father but Joseph? And this is Dr. Joseph, which is just the German version of Joseph. So to me, this kind of is like the Christ figure visiting, instead of the mother, visiting the father. And uh, everyone deserves guilt but you. That's what she tells him, and she erases his memory. <sighs> I don't know. I just really don't think this works very well at all. I, I think I get what they're trying to say. This is kind of like the, you know, resurrected Christ appearing to the people afterwards and there'll be like a new reign. I guess they're going to build the dance academy up again. I just, I don't, I don't like it. I, I think you're looking at it in a way that wasn't intended to be looked at. Like applying the Christ figure to... Susie, I don't think necessarily works so great with this movie because, like we were saying earlier, it's very much a melancholic kind of a film. Well, I'm sure that there could be parallels being drawn to this climax. I don't think it works necessarily as well with this scene because she's the one who kind of grants him, I guess, 
she takes away the bad memories that he has from this dance academy that have essentially ruined him, right? And so from a more thematic standpoint and the way that pe- others have uh, viewed it is he was a victim of something that he never got involved with, never was, never was supposed to get being get involved with in the first place. And so they were taking away these memories because he's not the person that needs to have this kind of guilt and shame. Rather, others who are part of the dance academy who did abuse their power are. And I think that... The lady, I forget her name. I think it might be Miss Tanner, actually, who was taking care of Mother Marcos. I think she's the one who's like alive to feel that guilt and shame that everybody else had to pay for. And so what I'm seeing here is that he's somebody, Dr. Yosef is somebody that doesn't necessarily n- need to have that. So she takes it away from him uh, because that guilt and shame, once again, is something that needs to go to those who do abuse their power, which he does not do in this film. Yeah, I I mean, I don't see how you couldn't see the inversion of the Trinity with all of what's presented here and all that's what's done here. But I know that's not everybody's interpretation reading of it. That's fine. But just with having m- the three mothers, which already invokes uh, Trinity-esque thought of of different things and his name being Yosef and her kind of spirit and transfiguration and almost you could look at it as the cleansing of their temple, just as Christ cleansed his temple. I'm not saying she is Christ at all. I'm saying it's the upside down Christ, you could say. That's just the spiritual reading that I get from it and how they're playing that off. Either way, I think we can agree that there is just kind of a true lacking of kind of like clear morality here at the end. Yeah, to a certain extent, I can agree with that. It's very much meant to leave you with this great despair at the very end. Maybe to invoke that those who have, those who abuse their power are those that, maybe to show, to show that this is what happens when an abuse of power comes about or something, something along those lines where they overstep their boundaries to a point where even those that they're supposed to be protecting or working with or becoming more of their toys and than anything else so alan what is your rating and recommendation for suspiria so luca i think is a very interesting director because both with this movie and call me by your name the message isn't really much of a much of a message than it is an experience. There are certain things that are here that I, no, don't get me wrong. That's not that it doesn't not that either one doesn't have a message, but more to the fact that the experience is more on a higher plane of uh, it's, it's more a, they pay more attention to the experience than they do the overall message. Um, that being said, I would have liked for a movie that is like this to have something a bit more to say than what it does have to say. I've mentioned abuse of power and motherhood as big themes here, uh, and to a certain extent that can still be considered part of a message. That aside, I have this list of movies, and right now it's two. Uh, this list of movies are movies that I would never want to see again, and this is number two on my list. I never really want to see this movie again, not necessarily because I think it's a terrible, offensive, t- terrible movie, to a certain extent maybe, but more to the fact that it left me with such great despair when I finished it and great sadness. And I was like, ah, I never wanted, I just never wanted to have the same experience again, at least not for a while. The other movie on this list is also uh, Requiem for a Dream, which I personally consider to be a much better and much better in terms of filmmaking than this one. Um, with that being said, on a second viewing, it's not that scary anymore. It kind of Aside from really the, the very last ritual scene, there isn't much that is there to make it scary. Once again, this could just very well be because I watched it in the same week. Um, so overall, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10, but it's not going to be recommended for me. I don't really want to ever go back and watch this. I'll give it this. It's effective. But at the same time, I wish it just had a bit more to say for it to rectify why it is so effective. Luca Guadino's Suspiria separates itself so drastically from the Argento original, this film could could and maybe should be called something completely different since this truly is a complete reimagining of the base source material. 
I appreciate they made this an original work. Certain shots work well to convey character relationships or Cold War tensions brought into the Dance Academy, but most shots dabble with the bland or overdone, which is a letdown considering Sayambu's work was well done in Call Me By Your Name. Suspiria's plot lacks focus, its characters have underdeveloped motivations, and its ultimate inverted worldview is morally repugnant. Needless to say, I'm disappointed with Guadino's Suspiria. It receives 4 stars out of 10 with a solid not recommend. And Argento is with us, Alan. Dario Argento oh, yes. saw it, and he is like, I don't like this movie at all. It is no good. And he was <laughs> like, where's the color? Where's the flair? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's this is a much different film compared to his original. I can I can see why he wasn't that big of a fan of it because really all his movies really have a big emphasis on color for the most part. Yeah, that is true. Well, so I want to know your order of the Three Mothers plus Suspiria. Oh, yes. Okay. So for me, it's going to be number one is Suspiria from 1977, then Inferno, then the new Suspiria, then Mother of Tears is how I'm going to rank them for me personally. My ranking of the Three Mothers plus Suspiria is Suspiria, the Dario Argento original, Inferno, Luca Guadino Suspiria, and Three Mothers. So so we have the same list. <laughs> well, yeah, what a surprise. It's exactly the same. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I'm a little Three mothers out right now. <laughs> Uh, I will, of course, return to Suspiria and very possibly Inferno, and my feelings have Inferno have lightened up a bit now that I understand what a Jallo film is. If you don't know, look it up. It's G-I-A-L-L-O. I get more what he's doing there now, and it does have some good... Uh, it's kind of like just watching a nightmare unfold or this really bizarre dream. So I do like it for that aspect. I, I'm still not changing my overall thoughts. I still don't think I would recommend just the average viewer sit down and watch Inferno. I think you'd really like to have a hankering for horror per se, and then especially Italian horror in those. It's different than American horror, to say the least. Very different. Yeah. We actually has color. That's the big one of the big. Yeah, different things. it uh, which the color is brilliant in Inferno and Suspiria. Well, listeners, next week is my birthday pick. Yay. You're, if you're listening to this, my birthday has already uh, transpired. It was a wonderful birthday, at least. That's how I'm I'm hoping it will go. I'm sure it'll be good. <laughs> yeah, at the time of this recording, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> That's true. It hasn't happened yet. But by the time you're listening, it has happened yet. I know very Back to the Future-esque with how everything is going on here with this recording. But... I'm going to reveal right now my birthday pick. I'm not sure if very many of you have heard of it. It's one that uh, is not really talked about very much anymore. It's regarding Henry. Alan, have you ever heard of that movie? I have, mostly due to the composer that's attached to it. Aside from that, that aside from just knowing it by name, I know essentially nothing else. I have only seen Regarding Henry once. It was a few years ago. My dad introduced me to it, and I thought it would be a good movie to revisit, revisit its themes and worldview. Also, who doesn't love Harrison Ford? Ah, uh, yes. And uh, he's got some pretty talented people working with him. Oscar winner Mike Nichols, Alan said Hans Zimmer, and the writer, who I will keep a secret until next week, but I think many of you will be surprised who wrote the movie. Also, I kind of want a little bit of a mental break from Jacob's Ladder and Suspiria. We did have Patterson, yeah. but after Suspiria, oh, it's so heavy regarding Henry will be a, a nice break. Yes, I, I hope it will be because, oof, I'm just kind of glad to be done with Suspiria at this moment. I kind of want to go back and watch the original because that one's just so much fun to watch. But yeah, I'm I'm curious to see what's going to happen with regarding Henry. I like I said, only know any, only thing I know about it is its name, and other than that, nothing else. Oh yeah, and the composer that's attached to it. That's it. So it'll be interesting to see where, where our thoughts lie next week. It is on Amazon Prime, listeners. So if you do have Amazon Prime, then you can go and watch it free with your subscription right now. So I recommend doing that before you listen to our podcast. 
So listeners, make sure to subscribe right now, and then we will be coming to you with an M. Night Shyamalan retrospective. We're going to be reviewing all of his films, including his very first one no one has probably ever heard of called Praying with Anger. It's on YouTube. Oh, it's on YouTube. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, let's go with that. Uh, I actually am looking forward to this. I want to see where he began. I am too. Just out of sheer curiosity. Yeah. Um, I'm also excited. We're going to be reviewing the two Pet Cemetery movies. The new one is coming out this week because I just started the book. Well, by the time the podcast is out, I will be halfway through the book. But the book's really good so far, so I'm excited to read that and see how it compares to the movie. We're also doing the Men in Black series, Back to the Future, all four Mad Max films. So we've got a lot of great retrospectives coming up in a lot of variety there's something for everyone so like i said if you're not yet subscribed go ahead and click subscribe share it with your friends and family because we love talking about movies and we love talking about them with you so join in on the conversation what you thought of suspiria make sure to go to the comment section below type up your thoughts because we want to know what you thought of this movie I know it was kind of polarizing when it came out, but it's got a pretty high IMDb score. It's only 0.5 lower than uh, the original Suspiria. But uh, we're done with Argento for a while. We're done with some of these heavier, darker things. It's time to lighten up the mood a little bit for the new year here. So listeners, thank you so much for joining us. 